Right. right, we're now live. Good morning, everybody. We are having some great technical difficulties at the moment, so I don't know how long we're going to be live for, but I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Con from Agraris Data Agents in Sydney. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Stephen. I'm incredibly grateful for you joining us. So thank you very much, Con. I have Back again. Okay, right. got you. Hello, Con. <laughs> G'day, Start mate. Again. Good to see so, you all. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning to everybody joining us. Say hello to Con. So Con's joining us from McGraw Estate Agency in Sydney. Um, we have a pleasure of meeting, I think, about four years ago when um, Luke, I and Sean and Alex and Adam popped into your office. Um, you were very yes. kind to give us about 35 seconds of your time, but thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you <laughs> anyway. Um, good morning, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Um, and so you've recently gone from um, being head of sales at McGraw to becoming yes. a principal. Um, yes. I think you um, have a team of 40. You're looking yes. over um, five regions. Yes. So um, thanks very much for your time this morning. Incredibly grateful. I understand you're in lockdown as well. And yes. things are pretty challenging in Sydney. So just um, give us a flavour. Tell us about your story, how you got into working for McGraw, becoming head of sales, and then the decision to go from um, being head of sales to actually running your own um, franchise. Yeah, no problem, Stephen. Good to see you, mate. Thanks for your time. Um, look, uh, I don't come from a real estate background. Um, so this is the funny thing. I've only been in real estate for, this is my seventh year now. I actually wow. worked for a French mail and logistics company from when I was 19 to 34. They're actually uh, originally from Romford in Essex, a company called Neopost. Okay. And um, I had my, my apprenticeship in telemarketing and telesales through to field sales, team leader, sales manager, state manager, national manager. And then I ran group, uh, group sales for Asia Pacific. But McGrath were a client of mine. And uh, I was living in Melbourne at the time in Victoria in another state and my account managers in Sydney were losing the business to a competitor. So they asked me to fly up and meet John McGrath and the CEO at the time to try and get the account back on track, which we did. And after about 12 or 18 months of winning more and more business, they sat me down and they said, we think you've got all the characteristics to lead a very productive real estate sales team. And I said, oh, that's that's great. But I live in Melbourne and I'm not from real estate. And they said, no, we know that. <laughs> and so um, I, I kind of I had I'd hit a glass ceiling in my last role. I hadn't really learned much. And at, at the age of 34, I thought that I'd achieved everything that I could possibly have achieved and I wanted to be uncomfortable. And so I looked at the brand. I looked at the market. Eastern suburbs of Sydney in, in real estate is, you know, uh, amongst being in the UK, London, Tokyo, Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, et cetera. And um, I thought it was time for me to, to grow. And so I took that role as uh, the sales manager of John's flagship office. At the time, we had 30 sales agents doing roughly around $13 million in gross commission income. So it's a very productive office. And in our first 12 months, we grew that from 13 million to 19 million. And in our second 12 months, we grew that from 19 million to 26 million and ended up running a sales team of 52 sales agents. So what you'd call a, a, a super office doing a billion dollars uh, plus in sales. And I guess for that success, I took on a region and then another region and then New South Wales and then ended up being the head of sales. But to cut a very long story short, um, one of the benefits of being director of sales was kind of learning what not to do and kind of handling pressure. What I mean by that is at the time we had the euro crisis, we had a public, uh, a private to public float. We had agents leave our brand. We had a stock price that kind of had plummeted from being, you know, uh, from where it launched. And I guess after three boards and three CEOs, I decided that it was time for me to lead a different business. And uh, I was very open with John and, and the board at the time and spoke to him about my ambitions. And I had a, uh, I had a six-month hiatus where I flew to the south of America in, in terms of 
the United States, hired a pickup truck and drove from Houston to Louisiana and all throughout the the, uh, the South. And when I came back, there was an opportunity to to buy the office in Parramatta, which is uh, Australia's fifth largest city at the moment. Okay, well, well, there's loads to unpack from just everything you said there. So thank yes. you. Uh, what an incredible story. You mentioned a word which I found interesting, and it wasn't Romford in Essex, by the way. And morning, <laughs> Richard. Thanks very much for joining us. But you talked about being uncomfortable. You mm -hmm. wanted to. You wanted to be uncomfortable. Yes. What What do you mean by that? Because I think it's really important for a lot of agents to be uncomfortable to get comfortable. You know, they need to get out of their comfort zone. They need to challenge themselves. And a lot of people um, find that very challenging. So, you know, how did you, you know, one, why did you want to get uncomfortable? And two, yeah. you know, how did you go about doing it? Morning, Ashley, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I think, um, I think you know, you know, nothing grows in your comfort zone. We've all heard that saying, right? And we've also heard um, the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. So I look at those two things and I kind of unpack that and I go, okay, at that point in my life, what, what was I providing to my community? What was I providing to my family? What was I providing to myself? So my learning and development had come to a halt and that's not the company's fault. That was my fault. So I had stopped developing my skill set as a leader. I'd stopped learning about my industry and the trends and what was working and what was not. And I guess it just was kind of... Um, by, by luck that this opportunity popped up. And I thought to myself, if I'm to grow to that next level, whatever that next level looks like, I need to get really uncomfortable. And really uncomfortable is doing something that you don't like doing, i.e. going to the gym and doing squats, i.e. doing a listing presentation or a role play in front of your peers or your colleagues, i.e. making a telephone call and having someone critique it in front of you. And so at that point in my life, Stephen, I just thought that for me to grow exponentially, I had to get really uncomfortable. So I left a state. I left a job after 15 years as a very senior executive. And I joined a new industry and I had to learn everything from scratch. But I had these great foundations of, you know, 15 years of sales skills and leadership skills that were going to help me. And I didn't know at the time they would. But what I uncovered throughout that growth period was I knew and I found out and I backed myself that I'm capable of more. And the thing that holds most people back, most sales agents, and I've had the ability of coaching agents that are launching their careers and I've got pinnacle agents, is that fear is what holds people back. Fear of being successful, fear of the unknown, fear of taking a risk, fear of asking that right question. And when you kind of put that mental handbrake down and you let the car roll, that's when you gain momentum and that's when, you know, things things to, you know, kind of change in your life, in my opinion. So how do you overcome that fear? Because we've got a lot of people that are watching that are going to be, as you said, either a new starter or actually at the pinnacle of their career, top of their career. You've got people in between. So, yes. you know, how do you come over that fear? You just back yourself, mate. There's no, there's no, there's no very easy, I mean, there's no long answer. You just got to back yourself. If you think you're good enough and there's a fine line between ego and uh, confidence, if you've got enough confidence that this was the right move and this is the right career choice and you're coachable, which is the biggest thing that I can always coach with my agents, there's, there's two things. There's skill and will. Skill can be taught, will cannot. Okay, so if you're skillful enough, you're coachable enough, your antenna switched on, that you can take on feedback, good, bad or otherwise, and you can read the play in terms of where, if I did this, this will take me here then that's how you kind of win. So for example, one of the things that we speak to our junior agents, a lot of them have call reluctance. They don't want to pick up the phone. They don't want to cold call uh, because the fear, the fear is rejection. And I just kind of coach them, Steve, and saying everything that you want in life is at the end of that telephone call. All you've got to simply do is pick it up. And so what we do is we work on the story that's in between our ears saying, I'm not good enough. I don't want to get uncomfortable. I don't want to leave my company. I don't want to learn something new because I am in my comfort zone. Well, guess what? That's a, that, unfortunately, that's as good as what it can get for some people. So when we start kind of breaking through those mooring lines and those glass ceilings of what's possible, that's when the magic happens. 100%. Totally agree. So you also talked about handling pressure. Hmm. 
how do you handle pressure? Because it is a challenging job. You know, as you say, you're going to have, um, I think this is a real roller coaster of a profession. You're going to have absolutely fantastic days. You're going to have, you know, days where people pull out of transactions, um, people are rude, they're shouting at you, they're screaming at you. Um, you've also got to look after a team of 40 as well. Um, how do you deal with that pressure? Yeah, so I, I think um, you, you've got to learn to adapt. I mean, right now, where, where we are in our business, I have, you know, 22 salespeople, a team of property managers and support staff that are locked between five different regions and they can't perform their jobs. There's no open homes. There's no on-site auctions. I haven't physically seen most of my team for seven or eight weeks now. And I look at that and I go, well, the team that wins is not the team that has the fear and anxiety or is curled up in the you know fetal position. The team that wins is the future-focused thinking agent or agency that adapts and has resilience. So one of the things that we talk about in our business is having a survival plan. So what does surviving look like? How do you win today and then worry about tomorrow, tomorrow? And then tomorrow, win tomorrow, and you stack those up, Stephen, and that's when you get across. So I think... Life experience gives you resilience. I think your ability to regulate your emotions and conserve your energy gives you experience. So for me, it's very simple. I do CrossFit every single day. And if I don't do that, then, you know, that kind of throws me out of whack. Um, and you've had other guests, Troy Malcolm, a good friend of mine and a colleague, he does the same thing. I think the other thing too, though, is, and there's a very good Simon Sinek video, which is, talks about optimism and positive thinking. So when, when you know, things aren't going to plan, you can... Think positive thoughts, but they're only thoughts. But if you overlay that with optimism, essentially optimism is positive thinking with a plan. So what's your plan to be able to move forward? And now that plan might be I'm launching my career or a deal's fallen over. And, you know, the, the big thing that we can do is react. But if you have the ability to regulate your thinking, that's when clarity kind of falls into play. So I kind of look at it right now with what we're going through as a business going, this is fantastic. We've had to adapt. We've had to be agile. We've had to use technology. We've had to be resourceful. And in the five weeks that we've locked down, we've done over $45 million of sales. We've listed 61 new properties and 25 new business managements for our property management portfolio. We've had a 100% clearance rate across our auctions. And right now, we're probably on track to have a record month. Why? Because we've had a survival plan. We've had optimism, which is a positive thinking with a plan, and we've stuck to our business operating system, but we've had to adapt to it. So routine sets you free. We've got the same routine. Sales meetings are at the same time. One-on-ones are at the same time. All we've basically done is overlapped the external noise and adapted to what we can and can't do. So I think resilience is a key. I think your ability to have an outlet and in my business, I have a mental board of directors. So my mental board of directors are the people that keep me healthy and fit, the people that help nourish my body. So I've got a nutritionist. I'm 42 years old. Please don't think that I'm an athlete. But I kind of think, of, think to myself, I've got this one body, this one vehicle. If I take care of it right now, it's going to suit me to, you know, I'm at least 80 or 90 years old, God willing. But I've got an accountant, a lawyer, and I've got my partner and my friends and my family that keep me grounded. So if I've got these board of directors that are supporting me, then nothing's really going to phase me. Okay. Absolutely love that. Brilliant. Thank you. Welcome. You have obviously worked with loads of top performers. What traits have you noticed that these people have? And I, I know you mentioned, you know, some of them there, the skill, the will, yes. um, you know, the adaptability and resilience. Is there anything else that um, top performers have? Um, and, you know, what can you do to become a top performer? Obviously, coming out of your comfort zone, um, yeah. making sure you make those calls, seeing every call as an opportunity. Um, you know, what else? Good morning, Laura. Thanks for watching. Um, so re really basic. He here's the thing. Everyone's got the ability to be a top performer. You just got to make a choice. And it's a decision to decide whether or not I'm going to be coachable I'm going to have a business plan and that business plan is crystallized. And what I mean by that, it's shared with the people who care for me the most that are going to help me on my journey. Um, I'm going to work out how do I become the subject matter expert in my field? 
So what does that look like? Property, architect, per square meter rate, record sale price, house unit. What are the trends? What's happening? What's working? How do you read the data? But can I be really, really frank with you, Stephen? No. The two operators that I've seen in our business, yeah. it's really basic. They outwork their competition, number one. They have better product and market knowledge than any of their competitors. They are coachable. They are always sharpening the saw. What podcast con can I listen to? What book can I read? Who can I go and mirror? Even if I'm a top performer, how can I learn from someone that's doing something better than me? But the biggest one I actually think, and this is probably the most you know strange one, is top performers ask the questions that average or mediocre agents are thinking about. They actually ask it. So they are direct and they mix a balance of soft and hard energy. So what I mean by that is they've got this sense of urgency, they've got this sense of energy, but they can be soft, empathetic when they need to be, but they've got this hard. So, you know, Stephen, thanks for showing me through your property. You've got a great home. Let's get down to business now. Let's talk about why and how and what we're going to do to be able to maximise the the result uh, from this, you know, forthcoming auction or whatever it might be. So they think the questions and ask them. So tell me about your decision-making process. How are you going to select an agent? What's important to you? Fee, marketing, results, brand? You know, so a lot of agents tend to not ask even for the business. These guys will just sit there and girls, I should say, they will sit there and they'll go, well, Stephen, is there there any questions? Have I covered everything that I should have covered? Yes, great. Well, let's get to work. I've got no time to waste and I've got buyers that are ready to look at your property. So here's my form six, my agency, whatever, whatever you guys call it, and they ask for the business. So for me, I kind of look at those characteristics and anyone's got that ability to do it. They've got no magic dust that they sprinkle on people that make them better than others. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Love that. So let's talk about um, <clears throat> listings then and our favourite subject, fees. Yes. So race to the bottom in the UK at the moment. Um, yep. Shortage of properties. Yes. Um, some agents um, are dropping their, excuse the language, dropping their pants yeah. um, just because they want to buy the, buy, buy the properties. Yeah. Um, what would your advice be for them to um, actually increase their fees rather than yeah, so, lower their fees? So it seems like the UK is like downtown Sydney. And I would imagine probably, you know, uptown in New York. It is a race to the bottom. Um, the one thing that we do know is that it's an unsustainable business model, whether you're an agent or an agency. It will not work. It will not last. It is a market share grab to win that business or to buy that business. And you're hopefully good enough to leverage and get the next one. So my coaching around fees is, is pretty is pretty simple. Um, fee is important, but it's not the most important decision making matrix or process that an owner will make. So once you've actually understood what their mechanisms are for coming to market, why are they selling? What's important to them? How do they make decisions? And you do this by asking questions, verbal cues. You research them. Go to LinkedIn. Google their name. Find out who they are. They might be an accountant or an engineer or they might be in sales like us. So I always look at and, and, and go to my agents, people by value. So if, they've, if you value yourself and what you bring to the table, and what you bring to the table is unique and proprietary to you, i.e. your competition can't copy you. What's that? It's not a specific sales methodology or system. It's not a piece of marketing. It's not social media. It's you, your energy. How enthusiastic are you? Are you laser focused, sharp as attack? Have you got a strategy that's going to de-risk that owner? You got to remember, the fact that you're sitting in their living room means you're good enough already. You don't need to sell that much more. What you need to do is give them a compelling reason why they should exclude the other agents and only work with you. And in my opinion, it's all about mitigating risk. So how do you show them value where they can get a premium price for a fair and reasonable fee and also make sure we de-risk it from going south so then that way they're happy to pay whatever they want to pay, whatever you want to charge. But if you haven't done the work before and you go in there and then you're competing you know, at the lowest common denominator, which is fee and marketing, you're probably not going to win the business. So one of the things that I love when I came and I met you and had a great, um, great morning with Troy 
was i think we came on the friday and saturday you you had all your opens and stuff like that yes. and um you had a morning meeting where you were discussing okay so what sort of questions do you think we're going to get asked tomorrow okay Correct. on every single property and for right. me that was a massive lesson professionals practice before they play correct um and i love that and i think that's absolutely fantastic so can you tell us a little bit more about that and you know why you do that i mean obviously it makes sense to me um yeah. and it shows you know if your clearance rates are 100 percent, but literally you know what to expect from every single um customer that you're going to go out with the next day and i thought yeah. that was exceptional and quite simple to do as well yeah so here's here's our our thinking we're real estate professionals we do this 20 30 50 100 200 times per annum and some of us on this call may have been doing it for the last five or 10 or 15 or 30 years. So we know what the end to end process looks like. Yeah. Or we've got a really good idea. Or we should. That owner may have only sold once or might be only selling once. So they haven't had the luxury of what we've got from a transactional perspective to be able to know what's working or what's not. So my coaching to our team is we don't leave things to chance. We don't think leave things to market conditions. I don't really care about the market. The market's good, great. The market's bad, great. Doesn't bother me. Not being arrogant. I'm being confident that we have a process. And that process is understanding if I had one buyer and that buyer could only look at this property, none, no other property, what would I do to service that buyer that would make sure that I can get an offer that is strong enough for my owner to look at accepting? How would I treat that buyer? What's that buyer's experience? What questions would I ask? What information would I know that's valuable that they can't already research on their mobile phone or through Google? That's the first thing. The second thing is, if I only had one listing and I couldn't list any other properties and this was the only listing I could have for the whole year, what would I do and how would I service that vendor? How would I make sure that owner has the best experience? And the way we do that is by radical transparency. There's no gray, it's black and white. Let me give you all the comparable and relevant sales as to why we've come up with this price. Let me show you what's on market right now, but let me tell you about the invisible value about this property. Invisible value meaning the floors, what are they made of? The architect, the architecture, the period, the bench tops. Let's actually become professionals. So let's move from being amateurs and to pros. Amateurs hang out at 1% in our market with very low fees. Pros are hanging out at 2% and pros always win, right? So for us, we're always about what's it going to make, what's it going to make the buying experience easier? We supply building and pest reports, strata reports. Um, we've got, you know, on-site um, home lenders to be able to give, you know, borrowing capacity. We can value their property online straight away if they've got something to sell. We're making the buying experience unique and proprietary to us which then, by the way, Stephen, turns around to when we're listing, we're actually explaining what we do practically to the owner about how I'm going to get more money for you than the other agent. So what ends up happening around fee? We'll agree it's a million dollars. You're at 1%, I'm at 2%. So Stephen's at 10,000, I'm at 20,000, but I also charge marketing of 5,000. So I'm more expensive, right? Yeah. But if I got an extra 10 or 20%, don't I become the cheaper agent? Well, let me show you these four case studies of exactly what I did that helped me get that 10% above market price for you. Right? Brilliant. Thank you. So shortage of properties at the moment. Everything coming on, sales. I think it's quietened down a bit now um, in the UK, um, how it was. But I think if it's a good property, it's still going and there's numerous buyers on it. What would you be doing to get new properties on? Yeah, everything. <laughs> so we've, we've got the exact same thing. So stock in Sydney is 20% lower than the same period last year, which is 20% lower than the period before. So we're 40% down on the last two years, but we've got massive buyer inquiry. Buyer inquiry is up 40% because of lockdown. So the coaching that I've been giving my team is really simple. We've got an analogy. Let's paint the Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So by the time you start, painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge and you get to the end, you've got to repaint it. Your database is exactly the same thing. So let's call and connect with every single past client, buyer and seller that's relevant and in our territory, geography, 
and let's reconnect with them first of all and find out when was the last time they had an up-to-date market appraisal. In Australia, it's tax time. So one of the pieces of dialogue we're using right now, Stephen, is, Stephen, it's Con from McGraw Estate Agents in Parramatta. How are you? Good, thanks, Stephen. A lot of my past clients have been asking for up-to-date market appraisals in their properties for three reasons. The first one, to see what the market's doing. The second one is for tax time. And the third one is to make sure that they're adequately insured. But more importantly, we want to see if we can unlock equity in your property so you can use that for other investment purposes. When would be a good time for me to come past and give you an up-to-date live market appraisal? So the first thing I'd be doing is going back through my past clients. The second thing I'd be doing is everything that's listed or sold that you have sold, your team has sold, your office has sold, your competitors, competitors have sold, I would be calling the relevant geographical bed, bath and car clients and saying, Stephen, it's Con from McGraw Estate Agents. I've just sold. We've just sold. This has just been sold. What do you reckon your property might be worth today? Or Stephen, it's Con from McGraw Estate Agents. Just want to let you know that have you seen 1A Jersey Road? That's just been listed for sale. Oh, yeah, we've listed that. I've listed that. This has just been listed. It's got a price guide of 1 to 1.1. When was the last time you had an up-to-date? So what I would be doing is reconnecting with my past clients, working my database to find out what's been listed and sold that's relevant, um, reconnecting just with people to just say, hey, Stephen, it's been a while, mate. How you been? This lockdown's been crazy. I just wanted to check in with you and make sure that I've still got the permission to call you, email you, or text you. What do you prefer? Um, and I would be working through in Australia. We have open for inspections. No doubt you do too. And you've got, you know, we've got... Uh, realestate.com and domain.com buyer inquiry, I would be rewashing that data and saying, Stephen, you came through one of our properties four months ago. We had a great result at Jersey Road. We sold it for $2 million. Look, the purpose for my call today is I just wanted to know when you came through, were you researching buying or selling at the time? Buying. Have you bought? Yes. Congratulations, database. Oh, no, we haven't bought. Look, do you mind if I, do I have the permission to speak frankly with you? Because you might speak to a lot of agents, but why haven't you bought? Oh, come, we just keep, keep keep getting priced out. Okay, well, we, we, you know, and you can have that conversation. Oh, we were researching selling. Did you end up selling? We did. Oh, okay, great. You had a great experience. Are you still local? No, no, we've moved, you know, to the other side of the country. Well, I wish you all the very best. We are still local. We've upgraded database. We were researching selling, but we haven't made a decision to buy to sell because we don't know what the market's doing. I'd love to give you an opinion. If you've got half an hour, I can do it via Zoom or I can come and see you. I think what you've got to do you got to have that energy and that hustle, not hassle, fine line, hustle and hassle, to be able to build a pipeline. Because when the stock frees up, the agents that have got the listings have the market. The agents that don't have the listings will not, won't, have a, won't have a chance. Graham, thank you. You've spoken a lot about coaching today and development and learning. Who coaches Con? Oh, mate, I've got a, like I, I said, a board of I know you've got your board of directors, yeah. So, who's on that? Me? so I'm very, very fortunate that I believe I've got the best real estate agent on the planet coaching me. He's a guy by the name of John McGrath. So John founded our company 38 years ago, and um, he wanted to raise the professionalism of agents in, you know, the uh, 80s to be able to make sure that we actually had a professional um, industry. So John McGrath is one. And then I have another gentleman by the name of Shane Smollen, who's also on the McGrath Limited Board of Directors. And Shane was also a franchisee, and he's probably the smartest real estate businessman. So I get to bounce off those two people. But truth be told, you know, the people that uh, coach me uh, every day are my team. They're telling me by gut and feel and instinct and performance, whether we're on track or off track. So I can look at the market and I can read every report, but they're the ones that are actually telling me if this is working or not, because I can see it in their performance. So John is exceptional and I'm on your side. I agree. He's the best agent I've ever come across, um, across the world. Um, and yeah. I'm always singing his, his praises wherever I go. Um, what have you learned from John then? Oh, wow. Have we got another half an hour? <laughs> We've got as long as you want. <laughs> no, what have I learned from John? Um, so John, John is probably one of the most uh, detail-oriented humans I've ever met to the point where when I first met him, and I've openly said this to him, so I'm happy to share it with you, he was frustrating to work with. So he inspected everything he expected out of you. 
If you walked into a room and the room was a meeting and it wasn't set up for a meeting, it was unacceptable. If the blinds weren't even and they weren't actually, you know, lined up and symmetrical, it was unacceptable. So he taught me about having extreme personal standards. Not having extreme standards that are so hard for others to kind of keep up with, but the standard you walk past is the standard that is acceptable. So, for example, in my office, one of the things I do every morning, I get into the office, I vacuum the floor, even though we've had a cleaner, because I don't want my team coming in who are my customers thinking that we don't run a tight ship. Because when I go into their office or into their car or to their open home and it's not vacuumed or cleaned, then they know that that's not acceptable. So John's taught, taught me about extreme ownership and extreme standards. Um, John's taught me about, um, and I'll give you a really good example, in the business that I bought, um, we did a million dollars in GCI the year before I bought it, and it did 100 transactions. And I sat down with John. I bought this in COVID last year, and I had a moment of weakness, and I remember calling him saying, John, I can't do this. The world's going to collapse. Everyone's going to die. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. Blah, 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 blah. And he, he said to me, are you finished? I said, yeah. He goes, right. <laughs> Let's calm down. Let's actually look at, you know, what's real and what's not. So he's taught me how to unpack thinking, how to actually rationalize and conserve the energy. So why am I worried about, you know, you know, when someone springs something on you, Stephen, and says, oh, mate, I, I need to talk to you. You know, it's pretty urgent. The first thing our mind does is race towards something negative. And oh, oh my, I can't believe it. Stephen's going to leave. Oh, no, I shouldn't have spoken to him that way. I should have flicked him that lead. But then you call Stephen and Stephen goes, Matt, I just need some help getting this deal over the line. So you've actually wasted that energy for nothing. But John said to me, what's your one-year, three-year, five-year, and 10-year vision for this business? What can you do? Let's go through the non-financial and the financial. I said, John, I think in five years we can 5X this business. And, you know, I think that would be a great result. He said, yeah, it would be. What would you need to do to do it in a year? Who would you need to become? What would need to happen? And how would that make you feel? And, you know, I, I kind of sat back and it was almost like an aha moment. I said to myself, oh, geez, could I do it? Yeah, I could. How would I do it? Well, I'd need to recruit three or four key agents, you know, maybe one superstar agent and a couple of agents that want to be on a superstar team. Um, I'd need to win, you know, some key listings. I'd need to really upgrade my coaching, my personal coaching and training and that, that of my team. Subsequently, in the last 12 months, we've gone from a million dollars in fees to $6.5 million in fees. So we achieved our, thank you. We achieved our five-year plan in 12 months. We wanted to be market leaders in, you know, within three years, we wanted to have number one uh, or dominant market share. We've been number one for the last nine months in our region. I'm not saying this to impress you. I'm just saying... When people stretch your thinking like John did, he made me believe that I'm capable of more. He made me believe that my emotions are just that. They're kind of like, you know, water. Let them, let them kind of flow, but don't overreact. And more importantly, he taught me about extreme standards and, you know, having that as a personal kind of ethos. Phenomenal. Um, so you talked earlier about um, people learning and listening to podcasts and improving their knowledge. Um, what do you recommend? What are you listening to? What great books have helped you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, definitely look uh, in Australia, and I'm not sure if you've got access to it, but Million Dollar Podcast by John McGrath and Tom Panos. Yeah, we're regular listeners. <laughs> Great. So you've also then got Tom Panos's own podcast. Josh Fegan's another great real estate coach in Australia. Um, so there's a lot of real estate content. We've got websites, YouTube, you know, uh, learning management systems, all sorts of stuff. Um, a big fan that I've got at the moment, I'm, I'm doing a, uh, a daily stoic leadership course with Ryan Halliday. And uh, he wrote um, The Obstacle is the Way and, um, and other books as well. So um, I'm reading that. Gary Keller, I've had the fortunate pleasure of meeting Gar Gary in um, Austin, Texas at a family reunion through Keller Williams. He wrote The One Thing. And the millionaire agent, I think they're great um, learning and development. But I just kind of look at it, you know, that, that's all kind of the scripted stuff. One of the things that John's taught me recently is you've got grand designs in the UK because we pinched it off you guys, right? Yeah. He's taught me listen and watch grand designs and listen to the way the narrator speaks. Listen to his tone, his tonality, his pitch, 
Listen to the way he uses words and how he's mastered words. He takes you on a journey. You could close your eyes and you can envisage what he's talking about as he's describing walking through a property. So I look at those types of learnings more than the kind of standard or the traditional ones and go, okay, well, what can I learn? I, you know, I look, I, I do a lot of sports. So I look at, um, you know, people like Phil Jackson, who's, uh, you know, I'm a big basketball freak and he's one, been one of the best coaches on the planet. So I, I look at that and I'm just trying to take, you know, the best learnings that I can personally, but we kind of have a learning library that we share with our team. Uh, what's a really good book or podcast or e-newsletter that someone subscribed to that's helped them, you know, get better today. Brilliant. I love that learning library with your team. That's fantastic. I mean, yesterday, Luke and I, we went to um, Timpson's head oh, office, yeah. um, which was absolutely incredible. So um, incredible business, over 4,000 um, colleagues there. Wow. And um, it was really interesting just going in and seeing how a, a successful business works yeah um, and it's incredible and my advice to anybody listening to it is actually go and look at um who are the best in any business whether it's agency whatever and learn from them and see what you can take out and i know luke was already messaging me about five minutes after he got back some of the things he's already ordered as a result yeah. of yesterday um but that's something you know i'm going to look at doing um going and see visit other businesses um if they're kind enough like timson's were to have us um, and just learn from them. Um, I think that's really important, Stephen, because, you know, look at, um, I don't know what your settlement process is like in terms of when someone's bought a house and, you know, it's gone through escrow or whatever it might be and it's ready to, to settle. The, the In Australia, it's a, you know, can be as basic as, you know, that new owner walking into your office and saying, oh, where are my keys? And essentially they're handed in an envelope or maybe they get a bottle of champagne or something. But if you kind of have a look at, uh, how a car dealership operates. So Mercedes-Benz has a saying, and I'm not sure if you've ever heard it, but their belief system is the relationship starts after the sale. And so when you buy a new car, they spend more time going through the car, its operating procedures, how it works, what are the features, the benefits, where would you use it? They make it an event. Imagine actually giving that to your buyers when they move into a property, just say, look, I spoke to Stephen, the old owner. He told me the best cup of coffee is down the street at Flat White. The best pub, by the way, for a chicken schnitzel is around the corner at, you know, the Squire's Loft. Uh, bid nights on Tuesday night. Here's the manual for the pool pump. And um, here's the the electrician that did all the wiring if you ever need any help. Imagine that. I we know. Picked that we picked that up from buying a car. Yeah. Well, the other thing I would add to that now with the learning of Zoom, what I would do is I'd phone up you as a vendor and I'd say, what I'd love to do is just do a little video with you so I can give to your purchaser um, just to go through all the little things through your house that maybe you know that they wouldn't know, um, yes. who the neighbours, who your doctors, you know, who do you use and, and stuff like that. And then two or three days before you complete, just to say, look, I've recorded something with Con um, that I hope you find useful. Um, it answers loads of questions. You know, if you love that, um, you know, if you've got any other questions, please get in contact. And again, and so you know what the beauty about that is? So here's the, here's the beauty. We are in an experience industry. So great service is expected, but it's now about great experience. Imagine also when you spoke to that owner, I'm just thinking right now, and I said, hey, Stephen, you know, to get on the M4, if I go down that road, it's a car park in the morning. What's the quick or the cheap way to get there so I beat the traffic? Imagine the experience that the buyer has. Imagine also if you're smart enough as well, and one of our agents does this, and you've got me thinking now, what they do is because they refer so much work to a ha home handyman to get properties prepared for sale, he's just said, Stephen, every time I sell a house, I want you to give them one hour of free handyman service. You're not going to bill me. You're not going to bill them. Why? Because when someone moves in, they actually want a, an electricity point moved from that part to that part, or they want a, a, a you know a picture to be hung up on the wall, and they need some you know you know something. That experience when they sit down and they say, "Who did you deal with?" Oh, we dealt with the guys at McGrath. How was that experience? Oh, I've got to tell you, it was amazing. You know, not only were they professional. I mean, we paid a lot. Uh, but we're happy to pay because we love the house. But, you know, the after-sale service was outstanding. That's how you create raving fans. 
And that's going back to when you've got stock shortages, you can pick up the phone and they'll, you'll call them and they'll go, hi, Con, how are you? Or hi, Stephen, how are you? That's when you know you've won. 100%. So one final question. Yes. Ideal week, ideal day. Yes. So um, obviously you're with Troy in the 4am club. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, what's your ideal day? Yeah, so um, I, I could share my screen and, 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 and do that with you, but uh, we live and die by our ideal day and ideal week, but ideal core plans. So depending on where you're at in the business, um, what your role is and what your responsibility is, everyone has the ideal day. So for me, it's really, really simple. I don't do admin bef during what I call my business productive hours. So that's email um, and that's any, you know, paying of bills or any business stuff that I need to do. That is before or after hours. The reason being is we focus on high dollar productive time and the best use of my time is being in front of one of my clients, one of my agents, my team, my property managers. It's um, being able to push the business forward um, or being in front of an owner that wants to sell their property or a buyer that needs help negotiating to get over the line. So very, very uh, regimented, wake up at this time, have breakfast, go and train, come back, go to work, basic admin, very quick admin, and then I'm back into appointments Mondays, a sales meetings, uh, and then associate uh, training, which are our juniors. So making sure that we've got the tone set for the week, uh, what does success look like for them? What are their hard line and soft line KPIs, i.e. calls, connects, buyer appointments, market appraisals, listing appointments, the soft KPIs, what are they going to learn? What do they need to focus on? What do they need to tidy up? Um, and then I'm into all of my business operating team meetings, property management, leasing, new business, et cetera. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is all agent focused, one-on-one, -on -one, guiding them through what's on market, how do we get that sold, what's coming on market, how do we get that listed, and how is that connected back to their business plan. Friday is vendor day because we have auctions on Saturday generally. What do I need to do to help any of those agents? Do I need to go and speak to an owner about making sure their expectations are aligned with the feedback and where the market is? Or it might be recruitment. I kind of leave Friday as flexible and then Saturday is out in the field. Brilliant. Look, you have been an amazing guest. Mm. So much great content you shared. Absolutely incredible. So I've got some comments here. Great thoughts about worrying and unpacking thoughts. Great session, Stephen and Con. Amazing content. Thank you. So incredibly grateful for your time this morning or this afternoon. Um, I look forward to um, our next conversation where instead of six times it, you've got 20 times it um, <laughs> in, in two years. And knowing you, you're going to absolutely do it. Um, oh, you're a good man, mate. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Good to see you, mate. And uh, here to help any way that I can. Stay safe. Lovely. Well, I love your passion and I love your energy and it comes it comes out how much you love what you, you know, what you're doing and what you're enjoying and congratulations and I hope you get out of lockdown soon and things improve in Sydney. Thank but you, mate. Thank, Appreciate thank it. you all for watching. Thanks for your time. Um, please like it, share it, um, share it with all your colleagues because there's absolutely loads of gold in there. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a good day. Cheers, mate.